reincarnated with the strongest system. Chapter 681, What Are You Looking At B? TCH Nice to meet all of you you filthy mother f asteriskers. The once lively conference room immediately quieted down after hearing William's words. Princess Sidney, Ian, Kenneth, and Lilith looked at William in confusion. The same could be said for Emperor Leonidas, Evexius, and Gilbert. They never expected the half-elf to give such a strong opening greeting to the people who had come to see him. Only Chiffon, who was seated beside Princess Sidney, looked calm. She even had a smile on her face as she softly patted Bacon's head, who was resting on her lap. Shall we start the interview? William asked. I'm a busy person. I will appreciate it if you f asteriskers don't waste my time. The corner of Gilbert's lips twitched. As the headmaster of the academy, he felt embarrassed because he had spread the news that William was the most talented student under his wing. He even said that the half-elf was very polite and respectful to other people. Now that the bastard was spouting profanity left and right, he felt that he was about to have a migraine. Gilbert had no choice but to defuse the situation and stood beside William. William is still a little tired from his journey, Gilbert said. Forgive him for being cranky. I forced him to have an interview. William snorted as he gave Gilbert a sidelong glance. At least you know that you were the one in the wrong, William replied. Next time, don't bother me with this nonsense. Gilbert smiled as he placed his hands behind his back. He was afraid that if he didn't clasp them together, he might slap the red-headed teenager silly for being a stupid wingman. Boy, what the f asterisk ck. How could you do this to me, bro? I'm doing this for you, you ungrateful bastard. The headmaster of Silverwind Academy was starting to regret hosting the conference. If he only knew that William would be this snarky, he would have just stayed in his office and done paperwork. Any questions? William asked. In the second row of the conference room, a pretty lady in her early twenties raised her hand. William nodded his head and made a gesture for her to ask her question. According to what I heard, the 51st floor has been known to be unconquerable. Sir William, how did you manage to clear it? The pretty lady asked. This was the question that had been on everyone's mind, and they were dying to know how the handsome half-elf had been able to overcome the impossible. The 51st floor is indeed a very difficult floor to clear, William answered. The guardian of this floor had broken the taboo and actively tampered with the trial. Anyone that had stepped on this floor would be besieged by countless blood-sucking creatures. Once they were reduced to a weakened state, the Guardian would then use his authority to forcefully take their consciousness into a dream world. In that illusionary world, the person's greatest fears, sadness, loneliness, and other negative emotions will be magnified until they were overcome by their heart devil. William paused for a moment to help the listeners digest the information he had given them. When he felt that the time was right to continue, he finished the rest of his explanation. Once the heart devil reached its maturity, that person became a lifeless puppet and his heart would be eaten by the guardian, William explained. The stronger the person, the more power the guardian was able to absorb. Belial, the guardian of the 51st floor, intended to break the shackle that bound him to the floor. Although I am not a hundred percent certain, I believe that he wanted to escape the tower and become an overlord in the central continent. Fortunately, I arrived and prevented his plan from succeeding. The listeners were shocked by William's narration of the events that had happened in the tower. Because of this, their impression of William rose to a higher level, and they had already forgotten the profanities he had hurled at them earlier. Thank you for answering, the pretty lady smiled sweetly. Suddenly an idea came to her head. She knew that her chances were slim, but she still decided to give it a try. Sir William, you are my idol. Can I have your babies? William flipped his hair before raising his chin arrogantly. B asterisk TCH, fall in line like everyone else. William snorted. The number of girls that want to have my babies are as numerous as the stars in the sky. Wait for your turn. Instead of being intimidated, the pretty lady even winked back at William. 
she didn't mind his arrogant behavior. In fact, she loved it. Several beautiful ladies inside the conference room even used this opportunity to give William some flirtatious glances. Clearly, they didn't take William's words to heart. Strong individuals had the right to become arrogant, and for them, the handsome half-elf had the qualifications to be arrogant. Next question, William scanned the crowd. I don't have all day. Another person raised his hand, but this time, it was a first-year student of the academy. Those who manage to clear the unconquered floors of the tower become the owner of that floor, am I right? The first-year student asked. William nodded. That's right. Then, how come you became the owner of the other floors as well? The worldwide announcement even said that the previous families were exiled from the tower. What exactly happened? Is this a special privilege that you got from conquering the 51st floor? While the first-year student was asking his question, William was busy combing his hair and looking at the mirror. This act made the corner of Princess Sidney's, Ian's, and Kenneth's lips twitch. They knew that William was narcissistic, but they didn't expect him to be this carefree during an interview, where there are countless eyes looking at him. Lilith raised an eyebrow as she eyed the red-headed teenager in front of her. Perhaps it was only a coincidence but William seemed to have sensed Lilith's gaze and glanced at her direction. Although he didn't say anything, his expression was saying, What are you looking at, B asterisk TCH? Before Lilith could even react to William's contemptuous stare, the half-elf shifted his attention to the first year who had asked him a question. There is no special privilege, William answered. Those ruling families were kicked out of the tower because I didn't like how they treated the challengers of the tower. It was one thing for the challengers to fail, but those who did were captured and turned into slaves. I don't tolerate slavery and human traffic king. Since that is the case, I blackmail, negotiated with the guardians and had them expelled from the tower. Those mother fasteriskers had it coming to them the moment I conquered the 51st floor. I see. Thank you for the answer, the first year said with a look of admiration. Sir William, you're my idol as well. Once I graduate from the academy, I wish to be as amazing as you. Well, it doesn't hurt to dream. William nodded. Although you can't be as handsome and as amazing as me, you can still fight for second place. Don't be like Prince Jason. That B asterisk TCH is a no good bastard that only knows how to covet the wife of others. Don't be like him. He is a disgrace to the Creator Empire. Fortunately, Prince Jason wasn't in the conference room and was saved from William's slander. Unfortunately, the rest of the members of the royal family were there, including Princess Vanessa, who was glaring daggers at William for throwing dirt on her beloved's name. Even the smile on Emperor Leonidas' face stiffened because of William's disregard for the member of the royal family. In the end, he just sighed in his heart and turned a blind eye to the half-elf's words. The Emperor knew full well that Prince Jason was indeed in love with Princess Sidney. However, he couldn't allow his feelings to come to fruition. Now that William's fame had traveled far across the land, the Emperor had also become firm in his decision to marry Princess Sidney to the half-elf whose prestige couldn't be ignored. Several more questions were asked, and William answered them with eloquence. Of course, he would insert a few profanities here and there, but after a few rounds of snarky replies, everyone had already gotten used to it. The reason why B1 was able to answer all the questions properly was due to the fact that he was Chiffon's beast companion. They shared a connection and were able to talk to each other via telepathy. Chiffon provided the answers, and B1 twisted it to his own language. If only William was there to see the dumb bird ruin his reputation, he would have definitely summoned a lightning bolt and ended the blabbermouth for spouting profanities left and right. Chapter 682, Elliot's and Conan's Teamwork A deafening screech echoed in the enclosed battlefield on the 70th floor of the Atlantis dungeon announcing the arrival of the boss monster, Scylla. This monster was a ten-meter-tall giant, with six heads, and twelve dangling tentacles like those of an octopus. Five of its heads were made up of water serpents, and the middle body was made up of a beautiful woman with dark blue hair. 
Her bloodshot eyes gazed down on William as she uttered another deafening screech that created a shockwave in the surroundings. My goodness! This girl has anger issues, Elliot said as tendrils of lightning snaked around his hands. The angelic skirt chaser was an offensive type familiar. He specialized in long-range attacks using lightning bolts, while his counterpart, Conan specialized in defense. Conan had already summoned his death scythe and floated in front of William. His role was the tank of the group, and a fearless smile was plastered on his face. Kakik. Conan chuckled. Come, our battle will be legendary. Both of William's familiars were now at the centennial rank. William had almost maxed out the Familiamancer job class. He was confident that after this boss battle was over, he would reach the max level of his newest prestige class. Urchitu, Kasaganaga, Psoglov, Mohawk, leader of the Serkopes Monkeys, Jareth, the Goblin Paladin, Xerxes, Hobgoblin Arcane Witch Doctor, and Daz, Goblin Warmonger, took their positions around William. The half-elf was in the middle of the battle formation and had his arms crossed over his chest. He was busy appraising Scylla, and checking the information of the boss monster that was surrounded by the dozen millennial sea serpents that served as her guards. Scylla. Boss monster. Cursed sea nymph. Threat level, SSR, low. Myriad beast. Cannot be added to the herd. There was once a beautiful sea nymph who captured the heart of the god of the seas. However, a jealous witch turned her into a monster that preyed on sailors crossing her territory. Her powerful tentacles could easily crush a ship and bring it into the murky depths of the sea. When angered, she releases an ear-piercing shriek that paralyzes her opponents with the fear status, and weakens their mental resistance against mind-affecting spells. This monster's attack deals an additional 30% damage if its opponent is a male. What a pitiful monster, William said before putting a chocolate lollipop inside his mouth. The effect of the chocolate lollipop was Willpower X. This was the perfect counter to Scylla's abilities because it gave them immunity against fear, and high resistances against spells that affect the mind. Due to William's skill, herd immunity all the buffs and resistances he had would automatically be acquired by his herd and king's legion. Except for Elliot and Conan, all of William's party members were already at the millennial rank. They looked at the bodyguards of the boss fearlessly, while leaving the main dish to the half-elf who was leader of this dungeon raid. Let's go, William ordered as he charged towards the boss monster with Elliot and Conan flying on his left and right side. Urchitu, Kasaganaga, Psoglov, Mohawk, Jareth, and Daz ran behind him and all of them were looking forward to a great battle. Scylla raised her trident and several magic circles appeared around her. A few seconds later, contracted water blasts shot out towards William and the rest of his party. The power of the attack was equivalent to the impact of a bullet train. Kakik. Leave this to me hey. William hurriedly grabbed Conan's body and dodged to the side. Although the familiar specialized in defense, the half-elf knew that he wouldn't be able to take a full-powered magic spell fired by a myriad beast. Conan, don't face her magical attacks head-on, William ordered as he freed the familiar whose face was suffering from injustice. You've already died once when you tried to block the water spear of the water dragon on the 60th floor. Don't take your chances when fighting a myriad beast. Conan patted his chest with confidence as he flew beside William. Don't worry. I learned my lesson earlier. My plan is to just deflect the attacks and not face it head on. William glanced at the confident looking familiar and decided to give him a chance. His purpose of fighting in the dungeon of Atlantis was to raise the level of his familiamancer job class, and build his teamwork with Elliot and Conan. Since the Familiamancer job class was now a permanent job class that was placed in his second subclass slot, he would be able to summon Elliot and Conan without switching classes. The battle became heated as both sides clashed. William waved his hand and several ice spikes jutted out of the ground, moving towards Scylla. The myriad beast was unperturbed and easily dealt with the threat by a single wave of her trident. William pressed his palms together and activated the skill Icicle Realm covering the entire battlefield with shards of ice, 
which briefly slowed the movement of the boss monster and her minions. William wanted to get close to the monster, but the six serpentine heads of Scylla were not just for show. They continuously sprayed William with water attacks that were strong enough to instantly kill a Class A monster. The half-elf was currently using his Ice Wizard job class. He hadn't given this job class much attention after acquiring the Elemental Lord Prestige class. Currently, the Ice Wizard was stuck at level 30, and there were still 20 levels before the job class was maxed out. He intended to upgrade this job class to the next level in order to fight Rebecca in the duel that would be happening soon. Although Eamon had restricted him from jumping to the Saint rank, he didn't think much about it. As long as his job classes had reached their max levels, William was confident that he could take whatever Rebecca threw at him. William and Scylla had exchanged several long-range attacks, and were currently at a stalemate. Even though Elliot was firing lightning bolts left and right, the boss monster was a tough cookie to crack. Even though the angelic familiar was dealing continuous damage, alongside William, the boss tankiness was able to endure their attacks without problems. Here it comes. Conan saw dozens of magic circles appearing around Scylla and prepared to deflect the attack that William wouldn't be able to dodge. Conan had the skill Calculus and Tactician, which allowed him to do quick computations inside his head. This was a very crucial ability for the Defender job class because it would allow them to take the optimal position to block, or deflect attacks in the battlefield. Just as he expected, William was able to dodge most of the attacks, but was still susceptible to getting hit. Ha! Huh. Conan shouted as he summoned several shields that deflected the attack to the side. Seeing that he had successfully accomplished his mission, the Devil Familiar laughed, but it was short-lived. F asterisk CK. Who was the bastard that attacked me from behind? Kasaganaga roared in anger. Come and fight me, you coward. If not for the fact that its battle instincts had kicked in, warning it from the danger coming from behind him, Kasaganaga might have been hit by the water ball that Conan had deflected earlier. Conan lightly coughed as he pretended not to hear his teammate's complaint. It was an honest mistake and they were in the middle of the battle, so he decided to apologize to the rainbow-colored anteater after the battle was over. The battle continued, and William's party members were able to reduce the number of millennial sea snakes that were guarding Scylla. The boss monster had also lost one of her heads after William unleashed several glacial lands when Elliot and Conan gave him the perfect opportunity to unleash this deadly barrage at close range. I had forgotten how tough it is to fight against a myriad beast when I'm not using heroic avatar and the Ain Herjar job class, William muttered as he panted for breath. He had long gotten used to fighting with the power of a saint, so it was hard when his attacks didn't have enough power to deal heavy injuries to an opponent that was several ranks higher than him. The heroic avatar allowed him to jump to the peak of the saint rank. This was the very first trump card he had obtained after his second visit to the Temple of the Gods. Sun Wukong's strength had paved the way for his victory on the battlefield during the elven invasion. If not for its short duration, William would have been able to fight unhindered in the battlefield. Currently, this was the strongest trump card available to him at this point in time. The Ain Herjar job class, on the other hand, allowed him to fight at the initial stages of the Saint rank. The only advantage of this class was its ability to create perfect replicas of himself which gave all of them the power of a saint in its initial stages. During his battle against Belial and Chloe, William had used his skill, Heroes of Valhalla, to create 13 copies of him. That was equivalent to 13 saints that wielded legendary weapons, which allowed him to gain the upper hand against stronger enemies. Well, I guess this is fine as well, William said with a smile. This is the perfect training for my upcoming battle at the Misty Sect. The half-elf skated around the battlefield by freezing the floor under his feet. He knew that Rebecca specialized in ice magic, so he was familiarizing himself with different tactics that he could use to use her specialty to his advantage. I wonder how the conference went, William thought as he dodged another long-range spell from the boss monster. Although he felt a little guilty about pushing the responsibility to others, he really didn't want to be tied up socializing with other people at this point in time. For the time being, 
he had decided to dedicate his time to training in the dungeon of Atlantis for his upcoming battle. He was confident that his dependable wife, Chiffon, would choose the right candidate to attend the conference for him. Setting thoughts of the conference aside, William focused on fighting the boss monster in front of him, while observing Elliot's and Conan's teamwork. He was quite surprised that both of them were able to perform coordinated attacks, alongside his own, giving him opportunities to land a devastating blow on his opponent at the right moment. William was confident that, given enough time, his two familiars would also step into the millennial rank, which would make them more powerful. Although they were still a far cry from his sixth master, Chloe, William was still happy because he had gained two dependable partners that would make his life more colorful. Chapter 683, Go for the Kill Gabulg Ding Gained EXP, 1,200,000 Congratulations You have slain a Millennial Beast You have acquired Millennial Grade Beast Core Gained EXP, 1,200,000 Congratulations You have slain a Millennial Beast You have acquired Millennial Grade Beast Core Gained EXP, 1,200,000. Gained EXP, 1,200,000. Ding. Ice Wizard has increased a level. Gained EXP, 1,200,000. Gained EXP, 1,200,000. Familia Mansur has increased a level. Gained EXP, 1,200,000. Gained EXP. 1,200,000. William heard several notification sounds inside his head, but he ignored all of them. He was currently unleashing a barrage of attacks on the boss monster alongside Elliot, and Conan. Urchitu, Kasaganaga, Psaglov, and the rest of William's party members fought against the Millennial Sea Serpents and killed them using their impeccable teamwork. These three were already buddies for a long time, so their teamwork had also taken form. As long as Kasaganaga didn't go out of line, their combined strength could make anyone below the rank of demigod feel constipated. William's role was to deal with the Scylla and prevent her from reinforcing its subordinates. Although he was able to keep it at bay, the boss monster wouldn't be going down anytime soon. The boss of the 70th floor had a strong regenerative ability like a hydra. Even the damage that William had dealt to one of its heads had recovered in less than a minute. Mine and Elliot's damage are not enough to beat this boss, William thought as he created an icicle bridge in the air to evade Scylla's AoE attacks. I'll just wait for the others to finish fighting against the mobs. It will not be too late to gangbang this boss later. Even though William couldn't kill the boss with his current strength, the Scylla was not able to hurt him either. As someone who had fought against myriad beasts, and pseudo-demigods, the half-elf was no longer an amateur when it came to fighting against strong opponents. Since Aemon had told him that he couldn't jump ranks in his battle with Rebecca, he decided to take his training seriously. Gah! Conan slammed on the wall after blocking an attack that was meant for William. Elliot immediately took the front and unleashed a barrage of lightning bolts that were aimed at the Scylla's eyes, which made the boss monster take a step back, and prevented her from continuing her follow-up attack. Conan, are you hurt? William asked using telepathy. The devil familiar flew out of the wall and smiled. I'm not hurt. That attack wasn't even enough to scratch me. Right, William replied as the corner of his lips twitched. Conan's nose was bleeding, and blood was seeping at the corner of his lips. Clearly, he was not all right, and was merely acting tough in front of William. The half-elf could see his familiar stats so it was very easy for him to tell that Conan was at his limit. Conan. Health points, 2185-20,000. Mana, 120-200. Heal. William pointed his finger at Conan, and the latter's body shone. As a familiar mancer, he had the ability to heal his familiars during battle. This allowed them to battle continuously even if they took continuous damage from the enemy. Conan. Health points, 8185-20,000. Mana, 120-200. 
William used two more healing spells on Conan before the latter's health was filled up. After it had regained his vigor, the devil familiar charged into battle with a fearless laugh and helped Elliot deal with the boss monster, whose subordinates had now been completely wiped out. I'm rolling. Kasaganaga's adorable shout spread across the room. The two-meter-tall wrecking ball slammed on the side of Scylla's body, pushing it a few meters from where it stood. Together. William ordered and his team encircled the boss monster on all sides. Scylla's tentacles lashed out in every direction, sending Urchitu and Jareth slamming towards the wall of the dungeon. William was very agile, so it was very easy for him to dodge the boss monster's attack, but Urchitu and Jareth were not agile enough to evade the powerful tentacles at close range. Scylla screeched in anger, because she was now being besieged in all directions. Xerxes fired several debuff spells at the screeching monster in order to weaken it. After its evolution, the Hobgoblin Arcane Witch Doctor had learned multicast, which allowed it to fire multiple spells at the same time. This made Xerxes a powerful magical turret that could both damage and curse its enemies using the spells on his arsenal. Similar to Psoglov, it could now create a doppelganger of itself, making it a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. Eight floating spectral hands, unleashed void arrows, contagions, deadly venoms, and confuse rays, simultaneously. It didn't take long before Scylla was drowned out by this unholy barrage that made her continue to lose her edge, while being besieged by William's party. Daz uttered a warcry as it cleaved one of the tentacles that was holding Psoglov in a crushing embrace. The demonic dog fell on the ground with a thud. Thanks Daz, I owe you one, Psoglov said as it wiped away the blood that had seeped out at the corner of its lips. Daz only grunted and resumed hacking away at the Scylla's body. Although the time that it had spent with the other monsters in the Thousand Beast domain was short, it didn't shy away from interacting with them. The demonic dog summoned two black swords and hurled them at one of the serpentine heads that was about to unleash another water blast, preventing it from unleashing its deadly attack. Slowly, but surely, William's team hacked away the boss monster's health. Half an hour later, Five of the serpentine heads were destroyed, and Scylla's main body was bleeding all over. Seeing an opportunity, William created an icicle bridge, propelling himself towards the boss monster's head. He was holding a crimson spear in his hand and its tip glowed bloody red. Scylla uttered a scream of defiance, but her reaction time was too slow to block William's finishing blow. Go for the kill! William roared. Gabulg! William threw the spear with all of its might, embedding it on Scylla's forehead. A pained shriek echoed inside the dungeon as several red lines, similar to a spider web, spread across the boss monster's body, with the spear at its center. A few moments later, the boss monster's body erupted in a fountain of blood and collapsed with eyes filled with unwillingness. William and the others didn't lower their guard and continued to attack the fallen monster until a series of notifications appeared in his status page, confirming that the boss had finally died. Gained EXP, 25,900,000. Congratulations! You have slain a myriad beast. You have acquired myriad grade beast core. Special monster first kill bonus EXP, 10,500,000. Ding! Ice wizard job class has reached its max level. Would you like to advance to the next job class? Yes slash no. Ding. Familiamancer job class has reached its max level. This job class needs to undergo the progenitor ceremony before advancing to the next class. Until then, the job class advancement will be put on hold. William panted as he wiped away the sweat on his forehead. Although Scylla was only at the initial stages of the myriad beast rank, it was still a very tough opponent to beat. With this, I can now upgrade the Ice Wizard to Ice Sovereign, William thought. The advancement of the Familiamancer job class will have to wait until I visit Celeste at the Hestia Academy. For now, I will focus on the Ice Sovereign and upgrade it to its max level. While William was checking his status page, Psoglov and Kasagana hurried to the Scylla's body and started to look for its beast core. The demonic dog stabbed Scylla's head and pried it open, while Kasaganaga dug into Scylla's chest to try its luck. 
usually, the core of monsters appear in its head or chest. Since the scavenger duo wanted to reach a higher rank, they shamelessly took the initiative to look for the myriad core in order to consume it as soon as possible. Haha! <laughs> the core is mine! Kasaganaga's adorable and triumphant voice could be heard from the boss monster's chest which made Psoglov's expression turn pale. Damn it! Psoglov cursed. What rotten luck! Kasaganaga happily bit on the core and ate as fast as it could. The rainbow-colored anteater knew that the demonic dog was petty, so it didn't dare to show it off because there was a high chance that Psoglov would steal it. In order to reach its former rank, the deity of the sky ate like a hamster until its cheeks were all puffed out. William could only shake his head helplessly at this development. Fortunately, the system's reward was automatically sent inside his storage, so he didn't have to worry about the two beasts fighting for the myriad core. Let's go back, William ordered. Tell the Ingra birds to scout the 71st floor first before you let anyone explore it. It is better to be safe than sorry. Urchitu and Jareth nodded their heads. They were William's commanding officers and were in charge of the deployment of beasts in the dungeon of Atlantis. Unlike the Ingrae birds that could respawn after getting killed, the other monsters didn't have this ability. This was why, every time a new floor was unlocked, they would send the rainbow birds to scout, and record the strength of the monsters on the floor, before allowing the exploration teams to enter. This prevented senseless deaths from happening, and kept William's herd, and Legion, at its top fighting condition. With this, I am only thirty floors away from conquering this dungeon, William mused. I need to step up my game, while waiting for my father's acquaintance to unlock the full power of the dungeon conqueror job class. Once this job class is unlocked I will be able to raise an army that will not fall short from Malakay's undying legion. His agreement with Malakay was nearing its end. Soon, the Draco Lich would be able to shatter the shackles that bound him. William wasn't sure what changes would happen once the Lord of the Undead was free to roam the world of Hestia, but he wasn't too worried about it. He had already made a deal with the Draco Lich, and the latter had made an oath to uphold it. Deep inside, William felt that Malakay wasn't a bad person. He didn't know why he felt this way. The only thing he knew was that although Malakay and the undead army looked imposing, they were still the army that protected the last bastion of humanity, Avalon. Due to this, William was willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Chapter 684, It's a Win-Win for Everyone After his boss battle, William returned to the Thousand Beast Domain, just in time to see Chiffon chatting with B1, B2, Bacon, and Jurer. The moment B1 saw William, the dumb bird made an excuse to leave and flew away like there was no tomorrow. The half-elf didn't find this odd as he approached the pink-haired girl who had a sweet smile on her face. How did the conference go? William asked as he gave Chiffon a hug. Chiffon hugged William back and rested her head on his chest. The conference went well, Chiffon replied. William smiled and patted her head. That's great. Who did you choose to take my place? B1. Chiffon replied in a heartbeat. The smile on William's face stiffened as beads of sweat appeared on his forehead. He didn't expect that Chiffon would choose B1 as his replacement. System, I believe I told Chiffon to look for someone smart, and trustworthy, right? Yes. William used all of his willpower to prevent his face from twitching as he continued to brush Chiffon's long and silky hair with his hands. He liked how smooth it was, but the feeling of dread overcame his feelings of appreciation. Um, did B1 say anything out of place? William inquired. Chiffon's answer would determine whether or not he would eat roasted bird tonight. Chiffon shook her head. No. B1 did an amazing job. Is that so? Un. William glanced at Jurer, but the mace started whistling on the side. A few seconds later, it transformed into an arm guard and flew towards Chiffon's wrist. Clearly, it didn't want to meddle in the troubled waters. Left with no choice, William decided to seek the answer from a trusted source. Ash, how did the conference go? 
William asked through telepathy. This was the only way to confirm the suspicion he had in mind. How did the conference go? It was perfect, Ash replied with a hint of sarcasm in her voice. How perfect is perfect? You cursed everyone inside the conference room, including the royal family. I know you were brave, but I didn't know you were that brave. The beads of sweat that were forming on William's head was now a river flowing freely. Having a dumb bird barbecue was a very good choice. Ash's giggle could be heard on the other side of William's consciousness. After the conference, Princess Sidney had asked Chiffon if the one speaking on the platform was really William. Naturally, Chiffon didn't lie and told them that it was B1. Princess Sidney and Ash were not surprised by this answer because, aside from the rainbow birds, there was no other creature in William's forces that had the audacity to curse everyone until their fifth generation. For now, don't show your face in the academy, Ash advised. Emperor Leonidas, Evexius, and Headmaster Gilbert are out for your blood. It will be best to let their anger simmer down for the time being. Seriously, why did you choose B1 to become your representative? There were so many other candidates. William felt an upcoming headache. He bid Ash goodbye and asked her to keep her eyes, and ears, open for any rumors that would spread in the next few days. The half-elf knew that he couldn't blame Chiffon because for her, B1 was smart and trustworthy. Although the dumb bird was truly trustworthy, its habit of bad-mouthing and cooking up trouble for William was top tier. William pulled Chiffon close to him and gave her a kiss on the lips. The moment the pink-haired girl closed her eyes. William immediately summoned Stormacaller and Gabulk and instructed them to skewer the bastard bird that made life difficult for him. The two sentient weapons flew towards the dumb bird's location and, after a minute, a loud explosion was heard inside the Thousand Beast domain. It was the sign that B1 had detonated which made the itch in William's heart lessen by a bit. He planned to skewer the dumb bird every day, after it resp on for an entire week until it learned its lesson. Back in the Tower of Babylon. Several envoys appeared on the 51st floor bearing gifts for William. Since the half-elf wasn't there, it was James who shamelessly accepted the gifts on behalf of his grandson. The old scammer allowed the representatives of the different factions in the central continent to enter the floor of Asgard because this was also what William wanted. The old and the young bandits wanted to add more valuables to their family's treasury, so they decided to accept the bribes, and whatever the guests wanted to give them. Since the powerful factions were giving these treasures for free, who were they to reject them? Accepting gifts was fine, there was nothing wrong with it, but if they wanted to get their hands on their family's property, all of them could just keep dreaming. Your Excellency, James, the Ares Empire is willing to negotiate for the rights of ownership of one of the floors of the tower, one of the elders of the Amazon race said with a smile. If possible, we would also like to invite His Excellency, William, to visit our territory for a few days. This year, we have many warriors that have reached adulthood. Our race would be very honored to give birth to Lord William's daughters. James rubbed his chin in contemplation. William only gave me the authority to govern over this floor, so I can't help you in acquiring rights for the other floors. As for my grandson visiting your territory, I will do my best to convince him. I always encourage him to give me more great-grandchildren to hold. Almost everyone that stood at the peak of the mortal realm had heard about the Amazon race. There were even powerful warriors who would often visit the Ares Empire, in order to sow their seeds without needing to worry about taking responsibility. The Amazons didn't care whether their children had a father or not. All of their daughters were raised with love by the entire tribe, so they didn't lack in love and affection. For them, a man's only role was to give them their seeds. Whatever happened to them afterwards was of their business. Of course, there were also Amazons who decided to only have one partner for life and have a family together. Empress Androsta wasn't so short-sighted to prevent these kinds of relationships. The only thing that wouldn't change was the hierarchy of their empire. Only women were allowed to hold positions in the government. Even Empress Androsta's current partner, didn't dabble his hands in politics and spent his life at home like a proper house husband. 
it's good that we can reach an agreement, Your Excellency, the elder of the Amazon race commented with a happy expression. Don't worry. I swear upon our goddess Astarte that we will take good care of His Excellency William's daughters. This is a win-win for everyone. James nodded. Indeed. It is a win-win for everyone. The old coot was even thinking of ways to tie up William and toss him to the Amazon Empire to play around for a few days. As long as their lineage prosper, he wouldn't mind helping the Amazons squeeze William dry. The delegations of the other empires, and kingdoms in the central continent cursed under their breath. They were also thinking of using honey traps in order to lure the walking bag of riches, William, to their homeland. After James had accepted their gifts, the old man only pretended to listen to their proposals and set them aside. No matter what kind of offers they made, James would always say the same excuse I have no authority over the other floors. If you want to negotiate, go find my grandson. This answer made everyone's liver itch. If we could find your grandson, do you think we would be humbling ourselves before you? Know your place, you old fart. The business-minded people that came with the envoys had a different thought in mind. They approached James and gave their proposals to him. Your Excellency, we are willing to open our business on the floor of Asgard, a good-looking merchant said with confidence. In less than a year, several challengers will enter this floor to start the trial to ascend to the 52nd floor. Our Blackstone Trading Group is willing to invest heavily in your domain. Us, too. We would like to invest and set up shops on the floor of Asgard. Your Excellency, if possible, we would also like to secure a piece of land for our merchant shop. All of the merchants knew that the 51st floor would become the most visited place a year from now. This would be the floor where the challengers would congregate, and it was the perfect place to set up a business. Only fools would let this opportunity pass. So what if we can't take over the other floors? As long as we can rent the best places to set up a shop, we are the winners of this trip. James listened to their proposals and nodded his head. As a statesman, he understood how important trade was. Having more merchants means more taxes. James smiled evilly. More taxes means more money. William has already told me to accept all proposals and let them bid for the prime locations on the floor of Asgard. We will definitely make a killing before the 52nd floor even opens. James laughed in his heart. He knew that it was a good idea to come to the central continent to help William, and allow the resources of their family to grow. He was confident that with his scamming skills, he would be able to make all the parties bleed until holes started appearing in their pockets. I wish I'd brought Eve with me, James sighed as he thought about his cute granddaughter who was currently undergoing oracle training in Lont. Aside from William, and the wandering Morgan, there were only three Ainsworths currently in the central continent. Suddenly an idea came to his head and he sent a mental message to Ezio in order to give his trusted subordinate an order. Find my son, Morgan, and bring him here, James ordered. He has been wandering outside for many years. It's time for him to share the burden of our family as we make our presence known here in the tower. As you wish, my liege. Ezio replied and disappeared from the Tower of Babylon. Morgan had always liked his freedom, so James allowed him to travel to his heart content. However, William's battle with Rebecca was less than two months away. James planned to let Morgan guard the floor of Asgard, while he traveled to the Misty Sect to support his grandson. Also, his old acquaintances would be there, and it would be a good opportunity to have a reunion. It was the perfect place to brag about his grandson's achievements and make the old foxes spit blood out of jealousy. More than anything else, James wouldn't let an opportunity like this pass as long as he could make his old friends suffer, he would be about to laugh without any guilt in his mind. Chapter 685 Make me feel what it's like to be loved, even if it's fake. Princess Vanessa arrived at the Whispering Wind Tavern and found Prince Jason drinking alone in one of the rooms that were reserved for the royal family. She happily went to his side, and offered to pour drinks for him. Prince Jason sighed and agreed to her request, which made the princess very happy. 
The conference had ended a few days ago and she was still feeling the after-effects of William's cursing. She had already had a bad impression of the red-headed teenager from long ago. Now, her impression of him had hit rock bottom. She was also secretly happy that her grandfather, Emperor Leonidas, Evexius, and Gilbert were angry at William. The princess was hoping that the three great men of the Creator Empire would teach the half-elf a lesson and bring him down a peg. How did he clear the 51st floor? Prince Jason asked. He didn't go to the conference because he knew that he wouldn't be able to stop himself from feeling envious and jealous of the half-elf's achievement. Ever since he had lost against Lilith in the Tournament of Champions, Prince Jason had felt inferior to William and didn't want to see him face to face. He thought that with the help of Aemon's artifact, he would emerge as the champion and finally be able to show the world that he was way better than the half-elf who had become Princess Sidonie's fiancé. Princess Vanessa placed the bottle of wine back on the table as she narrated everything that William had said about the 51st floor. The more Prince Jason heard about the trial of the Devil's Floor, the more he felt that the distance between him and William was growing. While the prince was deep in his thoughts, Princess Vanessa went to get another bottle of wine for her beloved because the previous one was already empty. Since Prince Jason was not focused on her, she secretly slid a fast-acting pill into the wine and gave the bottle a brief shake before returning to the table. She then poured the wine on her cousin's mug, and the latter drank it without much thought. An hour later, she noticed that her beloved's cheeks were already flushed and his breathing had started to turn ragged. I think it's time for me to go back, Prince Jason said with difficulty. His thoughts were in disarray and he was starting to feel hot and bothered. It was at this point that he realized that his cousin had spiked his drink, and his reasoning was starting to fade away. Knowing that she had succeeded, Princess Vanessa pressed her body against her cousin's body, allowing her fragrance to further confuse his senses. Big brother, forget about that country bumpkin princess. I will give you my heart, body, and soul, so take me, and enjoy me to your heart's content, Vanessa whispered. Her voice was filled with temptation and seduction. She was secretly thanking William for leaving her cousin in his current depressed state. If Prince Jason was at his peak state, even she had to think thrice before trying to spike his drink. Since she had already succeeded, Princess Vanessa decided to take the initiative and claim her cousin as her own. Princess Vanessa firmly held Prince Jason's hand and took him to the bedroom. A slash N, the rooms that were reserved for the royal family in the Whispering Tavern have their own bedroom where they can rest after drinking until they get wasted. Soon, the sounds of ragged breathing and rustling of clothes echoed inside the room. Prince Jason did his best to hold on to the little bit of sanity inside him, because he knew that once he crossed the line, it would be difficult for him to get out of the current situation. Unfortunately, Princess Vanessa came prepared. Aside from the pill that he had added to the wine bottle, the fragrance and the lipstick she wore were specially made to befuddle someone's senses. This three-pronged attack made Prince Jason's struggle futile. Princess Vanessa kissed him passionately over and over, until Prince Jason's final shred of resistance snapped. The proud prince of the Creator Empire had finally fallen and was completely at the princess' mercy. Even though it was her first time, there was no hesitation in her mind. She was the one that straddled Prince Jason and offered her maidenhood to him. Just like a priestess offering a sacrifice to her god, blood was spilled and it dyed the bed sheets with the color of her innocence. You're finally mine, Princess Vanessa whispered in Prince Jason's ears. She didn't care if her cousin was not in his normal state of mind. This had been her goal for a very long time and the feeling of conquest made her feel that she had everything under her control. She surrendered herself to the pleasure and moved her hips without pause. It was as if she was yearning for something. Something that would bind her beloved to her and prevent him from slipping from her grasp. Soon, she heard a low grunt, and something hot and powerful spurted inside her. For a brief moment, her mind went blank due to the feeling of euphoria that grasped her body. As she panted for breath, she looked into Prince Jason's eyes which seemed to have recovered a bit of their sanity. I love you, Princess Vanessa said as she looked straight into his eyes. I have loved you for a very long time. 
I know you don't love me, but I don't care about that. Even if you don't want to take responsibility, I will not say a word. However, tonight, make me yours. Make me feel what it's like to be loved, even if it's fake. Princess Vanessa's almost pleading tone reached Prince Jason's ears, and a complicated emotion flickered inside the depths of his heart. After pouring out her feelings, Princess Vanessa hugged Prince Jason's neck and once again moved her hips. Once was not enough. She wanted to feel him more. She wanted to take his everything. It was at that moment when a sigh escaped Prince Jason's lips. Suddenly, Princess Vanessa felt a hand draw her head to rest against his chest, while Prince Jason's other arm wrapped around her waist, holding her in place. Soon, a powerful thrust made her cry out loud. Her body shuddered as Prince Jason started to take the initiative and explore her depths. Princess Vanessa didn't resist and allowed the storm to wash over her. Their roles were reversed, and now, she was the one that was completely at his mercy. The princess young, and lithe body was pressed over Prince Jason's strong and powerful chest, accepting everything that he was willing to give her. A few minutes later, both of them reached the peak and Princess Vanessa's body shuddered uncontrollably. She felt like fainting, but she held on using her willpower and bit Prince Jason's shoulder, drawing blood. As the two of them panted for breath they once again stared at each other's eyes. Several heartbeats later, the sound of kissing spread inside the room. This time, Princess Vanessa tasted its sweetness. It was no longer a one-sided kiss, but a kiss that both of them shared. As a tear slid down the side of her face, the princess of the Creator Empire finally felt at peace. Although it was only a fleeting happiness, her heart and body was satisfied. Not long after, she fell asleep. Prince Jason looked at the sleeping princess face for half a minute, before he, too, closed his eyes to sleep. Prince Maximilian sipped the wine in his glass and looked at the moon outside the balcony. His room was right beside Prince Jason's. A few hours ago, he ordered the manager to close the tavern and chase out the remaining guests. Simply put, he had reserved the entire tavern for the night in the name of the royal family. The manager didn't dare to reject his order and reluctantly closed his business to accommodate the royal family. Congratulations, Vanessa, Prince Maximilian said softly. Although it was only for a night, you were able to realize the dream that you have chased for so many years. A complicated sigh escaped Prince Maximilian's lips. This was the only thing he could do for his family. Although he and Prince Jason were always at each other's throats, the crown prince was someone that could see the bigger picture. Prince Maximilian didn't want to admit it, but he felt very jealous of Prince Jason. He had seen how devoted Princess Vanessa was, and sometimes Prince Maximilian wondered what it would be like to have a beautiful lady pine after him, the way Princess Vanessa did for Prince Jason. I have given you another chance, Jason, Prince Maximilian muttered. If you still throw this opportunity away, don't blame me for making my move. The crown prince drank everything in his wine glass and went back inside to sleep. He had guarded the two of them while they were busy calling the birds and the bees. Now that their lovemaking was over, it was time for him to leave. Whatever happened when morning came, he didn't give a hoot. He had already played his part, and he had played it well. However, he still needed to report this to his grandfather to prepare for any contingencies. Although the adults already knew Princess Vanessa's feelings for Prince Jason, the after-effects of their union would still require the power of the royal family to keep it under wraps. It's hard to be a good person, Prince Maximilian shook his head as he left the Whispering Wind Tavern. I wonder how William is able to keep his relationships with his lovers in order. Chapter 686 Having three job classes sure comes in handy. A week after William's conference in the academy had ended. Inside the Thousand Beast domain, a red egg started to crack. The bird inside it didn't come out right away. Instead, it took a peek at its surroundings to ensure that the coast was clear. After seeing that nothing seems out of the ordinary, it broke the egg shell completely and spread its wings wide ready to fly. At this exact moment, a whistling sound reached its ears, 
and B1 could only utter a single word before William's spear, Gabulk, descended on him. F asterisk CK. An explosion sounded in the Thousand Beast domain, but no one paid too much attention to it. Even the other Ingredi birds, that were currently taking a nap at their nest, didn't react at the explosion of one of their kind. For the past few days, every time B1 would respawn, one of William's weapons would stab it to oblivion. This was William's revenge for B1 slandering his good name. 72th Floor, Dungeon of Atlantis Ice Sovereign has increased a level. A three-meter frozen crab shattered to pieces in front of William. He had been fighting inside the dungeon for the past 19 days in order to raise the level of his Ice Sovereign as fast as possible. Three days inside the dungeon of Atlantis was equivalent to a day in the outside world. Since he decided to lie low for a week due to B1's escapade, the level of his job class had increased drastically. Level 31, William said softly as he looked at his status page. 69 more to go before I max out this job class. Ice Sovereign was the last Transcendence job of the Ice Mage class. It was one of the most powerful job classes wielding the ice element, which was perfect for his battle with Rebecca. Although William had the prestige class, Elemental Lord, it was a job that offered flexibility, instead of dealing massive elemental damage. The only powerful attack that he could use using the Elemental Lord job class, was the World End Tempest, but this ability only worked when he was in his Ain Herjar form. If he wanted to beat Rebecca on her home turf, Upgrading the Ice Sovereign to its max level would definitely give William the opportunity to use the territorial advantage on his side. While he was deep in thought, Chiffon tugged his shirt. Will, I haven't seen B1 for the past few days, Chiffon said. What kind of mission did you give him? After a lot of coaxing from William, he was finally able to convince Chiffon to call him Will, instead of Big Brother. Although he didn't mind being called Big Brother by his adorable wife, he believed that it wouldn't be good in the long term. Chiffon also understood this, so she did her best to change the way she addressed William. Now that she was already married to him, she no longer felt the feeling of insecurity that came when she thought that she was going to be left alone to fend for herself again. Don't worry, that dumb bird will be back in a few days, William replied with a smile. I'm sure that B1 will also be happy to see you. William patted Chiffon's head while sneering in his heart. Since he was connected to his sentient weapons, he knew that the slanderous bird had once again turned to an egg. Ash, who was standing beside them was doing her best to keep the smile on her face from twitching. She wasn't as gullible as Chiffon and knew that William was mercilessly punishing the vulgar bird for what it did at the conference. I never thought that the 72nd floor would be this difficult, Ash commented after looking at the frozen centennial crabs around them. A dozen centennial crabs attacking at the same time was more than enough to wipe out a party of adamantium-ranked fighters. Even though she had experience in fighting against opponents that were beyond her current strength, she still found it strenuous to be ambushed when she least expected it. Indeed. William agreed. His current strength was now at the adamantium rank, but the monster's synchronized attacks was truly a very challenging matter to face head-on. Not only were their shells very tough, their claws were as hard as steel as well. However, that was not the only issue. The ravaging crimson crabs could fire an endless barrage of powerful hydro cannons that were enough to annihilate anyone below the adamantium rank. If not for the fact that William had strong helpers, he might have been overcome by their long-range attacks, while limiting himself below the threshold of the saint's rank. Right now only Chiffon, Ash, Elliot, Conan, Kasaganaga, and Jareth, Goblin Paladin, accompanied William on his dungeon expedition. Urchitu, Psoglov, Xerxes, Daz, and Mohawk were currently undergoing a breakthrough in their ranks. They were currently in the magic crystal cavern of the Thousand Beast Domain and were waiting patiently to be promoted to a higher rank. This group of beasts that had followed William to the upper floors of the Dungeon of Atlantis had an all-you-can-eat beast core buffet, which greatly increased the speed of their evolution. It was only a matter of time before William would have a team of beasts that were at the peak of the millennial rank. 
Kasaganaga was only half a step away from becoming a myriad beast, but that small step would still take him a while to cross. Thanks to Scylla's myriad beast core, the deity of the sky was slowly regaining its strength. William hoped that after a year or two, Kasaganaga would regain his power as a demigod. The half-elf chuckled internally at the thought of ferocious monsters running away whenever they heard the rainbow-colored anteater's adorable catchphrase I'm rolling. William glanced at the frozen crabs and raised his hand. He then snapped his finger, and all the crabs shattered into hundreds of pieces. At that exact moment, Kasaganaga happily rummaged through the frozen chunks of ice to look for the centennial cores. Since its competitor, Psoglov, wasn't around. The rainbow-colored anteater took its time to dig out its precious cores, while humming a tune. Name, William von Ainsworth. Race, half-elf. Job class, quick-shot shepherd, level 30. Sub-class, ice sovereign, level 31. Second sub-class, familiamancer, max. Having three job classes sure comes in handy, William thought as he led the way to the path that would lead them to the next floor. Elliot and Conan flew several meters in front of him and acted as scouts. The two familiars had finally gotten used to fighting together with William, and the three of them had a silent agreement about the roles that they would play on the battlefield. William had also equipped Chiffon and Ash with new job classes, namely the Zen Master, and Morpher job class. Chiffon was a brawler, and the Zen Master was the monk job class second form. With this great boost in close combat abilities, the pink-haired girl's lethality in fighting against Centennial Beast showed her amazing battle prowess. Morpher, on the other hand, was the combination of the Elemental Lord and Rune Master job class. This class could allow its user to morph into a greater elemental and deal devastating damage to the target. William was pleasantly surprised when this job class was unlocked after his elemental lord reached its max level. Wendy did a good job in raising the level of the rune master job class when William was still in the southern continent. Because of this, William decided to let Ash use the power of this never-before-seen job class and see its power firsthand. When Ash took the form of a four-meter-tall greater elemental, the composition of her body would turn into the element of her choosing. The results of real battle tests were quite impressive, and even William was tempted to use this as a trump card in the future. After fighting for several more hours, William decided to stop their advance and return to the real world. He had been away for a week and felt that now was the right time to re-emerge in the academy. Although fighting non-stop made him stronger, it was also very tiring. Because of this, he decided to take a few days off from the dungeon, and gather information about what was currently happening in the central continent. Also, Princess Sidney had told him that Kenneth, and Lilith, had been pestering her, looking for William's whereabouts. In order to prevent his beautiful fiancée from throwing fireballs at them, the half-elf decided to confront these two people. Although he didn't know what the two were thinking in their heads, he believed that all three of them could come to a compromise and not make things difficult for everyone involved. Chapter 687 Reaching a Compromise Prince Jason and Princess Vanessa left the academy. William frowned as he held the beautiful Princess of Frisia in his embrace. Yes, Princess Sidney replied. They left two days ago. According to Grandfather, he sent the two of them to inspect the different outposts of the Creator Empire. But, I feel that there is something more to this news than meets the eye. Princess Sidney hadn't seen Prince Jason and Princess Vanessa since the day the conference was held. The two had disappeared from the eyes of the public, and even their close friends were not notified by their departure. William closed his eyes and pondered, while patting Princess Sidney's long, reddish-brown hair. The Prince of the Creator Empire and him had never been on good terms with each other since he had placed the collar of Wisteria on Princess Sidney's neck. The prince had also provoked him several times, which almost led to a brawl between the two of them. The half-elf knew that Princess Vanessa was dead set on Prince Jason. As someone who was also on the receiving end of such intense love, William admired the feisty princess of the Creator Empire. Deep inside, he wished that Princess Vanessa would succeed in putting a collar on Prince Jason's neck, 
so that the latter would leave him alone. Now that both of them were gone, William didn't have to put any extra effort in dealing with Prince Jason's schemes, which had started to become annoying. I guess I should visit the temple and pray for Princess Vanessa's success, William said with a smile. It never hurts to have the gods on your side. Princess Sidonie smirked, but didn't say anything else. She already knew what William was thinking, and she, too, wished for her cousin's success. I would greatly appreciate it if you don't treat us like air, Lilith commented with annoyance. You asked us to come here, and all you've done is publicly show your affection to each other. Are you that bored with your life? Kenneth, who was seated a meter away from Lilith, could only smile wryly. Although he didn't mind William being touchy with his lovers, he felt that it wasn't appropriate for the half-elf to rub it in their faces. William lightly tapped Princess Sidonie's back to tell the latter to get off his lap so he could talk business with his guests. Princess Sidonie sighed and reluctantly rose from her special seat. She then sat beside William and glanced at the silver-haired elf and Amazon princess with a scrutinizing gaze. I asked both of you to come here today to ask about your plans for the future, William stated. Kenneth, you've already delivered my mother's message. Aren't you going back to the Silver Moon continent? Kenneth shook his head firmly. Master told me to keep an eye on you. Don't worry. I won't get in your way, or your lovers. I'm just following your mother's orders. Kenneth stressed the word mother to William to prevent the half-elf from having a comeback. He knew that if he used this approach to his ex-roommate, the latter would be unable to turn him away. Just as he expected. William only sighed before shifting his attention to the Amazon princess. What about you? William asked. I already said that I'm not interested in going with you to the Ares Empire to become your tribe's stallion. I still have to prepare for my match with Rebecca. I know. Lilith nodded calmly. My mother received an invitation to the Misty Sect, so I'll be going there as well. We can talk about the details of your visit to the Ares Empire after you've dealt with your ex fiance The corner of William's lips twitched. He had clearly stated that he refused to go with her to the Ares Empire to become their stud horse, but Lilith just brushed it off as if it was not set in stone. Her stance on the matter gave William a headache. According to the books he had read in his world, Amazons were a race of warriors. They recognized strength more than anything else and would actively seek strong partners to have offspring with. Back then, he was still half in doubt about the authenticity of the claims in the book he read, but now, he was sure that most of what was written there was true. I don't want to experience death by Snusnu, William thought as he stared at Lilith who had a nonchalant look on her face. I know what you're thinking, but it isn't as bad as you think, Lilith said. I'll just share you with a dozen of my sisters. I won't let the entire tribe have their way with you. William pinched the bridge of his nose because there seemed to be some sort of miscommunication between him and the Amazon princess in front of him. It was as if they weren't talking in the same language, and the latter kept on insisting on her ideals without a care about his input. She reminds me of you back then, William commented as he glanced at Princess Sidonie. We're not the same. Princess Sidonie firmly shook her head. I did it out of love and lust, but she's doing it out of need. Frankly, I find this approach very despicable. She's not giving you any room to maneuver and is forcing her wants on you. You did the same. William, and Kenneth, said in their heads. Princess Sidonie had schemed her way into William's heart, while Lilith was taking the straightforward approach to pin him down on the bed. Although the reasoning of both girls were different, their end goal was the same. William sighed as he stared at Lilith with a fed-up expression. Your mother, Empress Androstet, will be going to the Misty Sect as well. Lilith nodded. She wanted to wait for you here in the Creator Empire, but there were things that she needed to do in the Empire so I stayed here in her place. Both of us would like to talk to you in private after your battle at the Misty Sect. Fine. William nodded his head. He decided to give up and just handle this issue at a later date. Just promise me that you won't bother Sidney again. 
I am also busy training in seclusion, so you won't see me in the academy much. The same can be said for you, Kenneth. Although my mother had asked you to watch over me, there are some things that I can't share with you. I hope that you understand. There was no use talking to Lilith because her view wouldn't change. However, talking to Empress Androstat was different. As someone who held the responsibilities of an entire empire on her shoulders, William believed that the Amazon Empress wasn't as short-sighted as her daughter. As for Kenneth, he didn't have any problems with his ex-roommate because the silver-haired elf had a good head on his shoulders. Although he was sent to spy on William, he didn't divulge any of his secrets, and simply reported stuff that wasn't too important. Because of this, William still had a good impression of him, so he didn't want to sour their relationship. Lilith and Kenneth nodded their heads. They also didn't want to push William too much because they knew that it could backfire on them. The only thing they wanted from him was a promise that he wouldn't avoid them intentionally, and the half-elf agreed to fulfill this promise. After their meeting, Kenneth and Lilith left William's room with satisfied expressions. Princess Sidney watched them go inside in relief. Now that William had spoken, she could rest easy that they would not be bothered by their non-stop pestering again. Darling, I know you are busy, so I won't trouble you much, but there is still something that I have to tell you, Morgana said after he swapped with Princess Sidney. There is one more annoying elf that is looking for you. Her name is Pearl and she claims to be Charmaine's elder sister. William frowned when he heard this piece of information. All of the elves under his command had been stripped of their memories by the arcane lich, and been programmed to be loyal to him. After their brainwashing was finished, the lich had returned their memories, but their personalities were no longer the same. Even with their memories, they thought that they were in the wrong and very stupid to stand against William during the war. Because of this, they had remained loyal to him and were doing their best to atone for their sins, by offering their servitude. In truth, William didn't care much about this back then. They were the invaders, so whatever happened to them, he didn't give a damn. Unfortunately, William's heart wasn't made of stone. After his lovers had convinced him to free the elves after a few years of servitude, the half-elf's treatment of the elves became more lenient. He wasn't feeling guilty about the brainwashing part. The thing he was worried about was how the elves would once again integrate with the elven society after their personalities had completely changed. William had long thought about this, but there was nothing he could do about it. The brainwashing was done, and the arcane lich had said that it was permanent. No one could reverse the outcome, so Charmaine and the rest of the elves would have to slowly adapt to whatever circumstances they faced in the future. Although he felt hesitant, William agreed for Pearl to meet with Charmaine he was also curious to see how his personal maid would treat her older sister, who hadn't participated in the War of the Southern Continent. Chapter 688, You're Just a Side Character Pearl paced back and forth on the outskirts of Silverwind City. Princess Sidney had met with her three days ago, and told her that her sister, Charmaine, would meet her in this location. After the tournament, Pearl had waited patiently for William to arrive. In fact, she was prepared to wait for him for two months. When she heard that William had suddenly appeared in Silver Wind Academy, she was both shocked and thankful at the same time. Shocked because she didn't expect to see him this soon, and happy because she would be able to see her sister sooner. She had also been at the academy when the conference was held because she wanted to find out just what kind of person William was. The William that she saw made her speechless. Not only was that half-elf a vulgar person, he was also a bastard that didn't even give the emperor of the Creator Empire face, and called him a mother fasterisker in front of the high-ranking nobles of the kingdom. Because of this, Pearl despaired. If her sister was in the custody of such a man, Charmaine would definitely suffer a cruel end. I must save my sister no matter what, Pearl thought as she calmed her anxiousness. No matter what price I have to pay, I will buy her freedom from that scum. While Pearl was busy thinking of ways to convince William to release her sister, her sharp senses detected footsteps headed in her direction. Sister. 
A familiar voice called out to Pearl with uncertainty. Pearl's body moved automatically, and ran towards the pretty elf whom she hadn't seen for years. The two sisters hugged each other with tears streaming down their faces. William watched this scene from afar. He decided not to go with Charmaine when she met her sister to prevent tensions from rising. Truth be told, if his personal maid wanted to leave with Pearl then he wouldn't stop her from leaving. This was the decision he had made after thinking for a whole day. When he told Charmaine about Pearl's request, the latter's expression became very happy. Although her memories were stripped away from her at the beginning, the strong emotions in her heart in regards to her family had remained. William told Charmaine that if she wanted to leave with her sister, he would give her his blessing, and not stop her from leaving. The pretty elf looked straight into his eyes back then. She didn't agree or reject William's words and simply thanked him for letting her meet her sister. How have you been? Pearl asked. Did that half-elf mistreat you? Don't worry. I will take you away from here and deal with him at a later time. Charmaine shook her head as she stared at sister. Lord William didn't mistreat me. Although my freedom was restricted, he didn't do anything to treat me like a plaything, like those other noble humans do when they capture our race. Pearl nodded her head in acknowledgement of her words. Her goal was to take her sister back, so she didn't want to have a disagreement with her before they were safely back in the Silver Moon continent. It seems that I misunderstood him, Pearl replied. Don't worry, I will compensate him properly and buy your freedom. Charmaine, let's go back to the Silver Wind continent. I promise that this time, I will not leave you alone. Charmaine smiled, but she shook her head. I can't leave him right now, sister. I still have to atone for my sins of invading his kingdom. He is the son of our Saintess, Lady Arwen, and our Saviour, Lord Maxwell. We were the ones in the wrong when we tried to conquer the Helan Kingdom. We made a grave mistake, and our race has paid for it with countless lives. Pearl bit her lip. She grew up with Charmaine and knew what kind of person she was. Her sister was arrogant and looked down on humans. Even though Maxwell had saved them from the demonic invasion, Charmaine didn't think much of him. However, right now, that same arrogant sister of hers was saying that she would atone for the sins that she had made in invading the southern continent. For a brief moment, Pearl felt like she was talking to a stranger that she had never met before. Charmaine, didn't you hate humans? Pearl asked. You also find half-elves disgusting. Why the sudden change? Charmaine closed her eyes as she placed a hand over her chest. Back then, I was still young and stupid. I had been raised in the Silver Moon continent and didn't know about the outside world. Sister, you didn't see the cruelty the elves performed while in the southern continent. We were no different from savage beasts. My eyes have been opened to the truth, and because of this, I will remain by Lord William's side until my sins are finally forgiven. Sister, I can't go with you right now, but I promise, after a few years, I will return to the Silver Moon Continent and find you. Until then, please, let me stay by Lord William's side." Pearl clenched her fists and gritted her teeth. The more she listened to her sister, the more she felt that she was talking to a different person. This was when she realized that something was very wrong with her behavior. What did he do to you? Pearl asked as she grabbed Charmaine's shoulder and held her in place. What did that bastard do to you? Charmaine gave Pearl a pained expression. Her sister's fingernails were digging on her shoulder and it was very close to drawing her blood. S sister, it hurts, Charmaine said as she endured the pain. Pearl saw her sister's face filled with suffering so she immediately let her go and back away. I am sorry, I got carried away. It's fine. I know that you are having a hard time understanding my words, but this is what I really feel at the moment. I can't go with you, I'm sorry, sister." Pearl closed her eyes and controlled her raging emotions. A few minutes later, she looked at Charmaine and her face was filled with determination. Without warning, she threw a jab, aiming at Charmaine's chin. Due to how sudden her attack was, Charmaine was caught unprepared and was hit perfectly, 
which made her stagger backwards. William's personal maid felt dizzy and she was unable to raise any form of resistance. Seeing that her sister was still conscious, Pearl gave a follow-up jab and hit Charmaine's jaw, shocking her brain, and forcing her to lose consciousness. I'm sorry, sister, Pearl said as she carried the unconscious girl like a sack of rice. I will bring you back to the Silver Moon Continent and have the elders cure you. Whatever that bastard William did to you, I'll make sure that he will pay dearly for his transgressions. Charmaine was unaware that her sister had already decided to take her back to their hometown by force if necessary, regardless of her opinion. Although Pearl made sure to control the strength of her attack, it was still enough to cause stress to her brain, which made her faint. Pearl had only been able to run for a few steps when the lady she was carrying suddenly disappeared without a trace. She hurriedly scanned her surroundings, only to see someone walking in her direction. Pearl squinted her eyes and used Hawk's eye and improved concentration to see who the person was. It didn't take long for her to recognize the familiar red hair and light green eyes that were looking back at her with a disapproving gaze. It's you, Pearl said. Her tone was laced with anger as she glared at the half-elf that had caused the downfall of the elven invasion. William von Ainsworth William continued to walk with a steady pace. His eyes never left Pearl's face as if he was scrutinizing every expression that she made. I agreed to your request and allowed you to meet your sister, William stated. However, I don't remember agreeing to a kidnapping. You have overstepped your bounds. Overstepped my bounds? You did something to my sister and you have the nerve to say that I overstepped my bounds. Pearl sneered. The one who overstepped their bounds was you. What did you do to my sister? If you don't give me a proper answer, I will. You will what? William interjected. He had enough of Pearl's nonsense and wasn't in the mood to argue with her. You're going to kill me. Yes. I will kill you. B asterisk TCH please. I am the protagonist of this story. You're just a side character so know your place. William's outburst made Pearl unconsciously take a step back. She had faced many strong members of the young generation during the tournament, but William's countenance made her feel that she was up against a strong opponent. I already gave you a chance to meet your sister, William said with indifference. You also heard her answer. She didn't want to come with you. Since that is the case, I will not allow you to take her away. Pearl gritted her teeth and summoned her bow. If I can kill him, my sister will be freed from his clutches. William sighed when he saw the elf was preparing to fight him. You want to fight? Fine, William sneered. I'll gladly play with you. Several portals appeared above William and several pegasus flew out of it with riders mounted on their back. Pearl's eyes widened when she saw that the mounted warriors of the Pegasus were elves. Surprised already? William chuckled. There's more where that came from. An overwhelming presence descended upon Pearl as another portal appeared right above her. Before she could even draw her bow, she saw a rainbow-colored wrecking ball charging in her direction. I'm rolling. That was the last thing Charmaine heard before she was knocked off from where she stood, and her world descended into darkness. Chapter 689 When the Red Plague Ascends, Calamity Descends Somewhere in the Central Continent Boss, someone is looking for you, a skinny man reported as he walked towards the main hall of their base. A handsome man who seemed to be in his late thirties opened his eyes and glanced at his subordinate with an even gaze. Name the man asked. He ran his hand over his short red hair, as he shook the last vestige of sleep from his system. The skinny man could sense that his boss was feeling grumpy, so he decided to cut to the chase and stop talking nonsense. H. He said his name is Ezio, the skinny man replied. The handsome man's body stiffened before standing up from where he sat. He hurriedly left the main hall, leaving his subordinate behind with a shocked expression. Their boss had always had a calm expression on his face, but after hearing the familiar name, a trace of shock and happiness appeared on his handsome face. A few minutes later, the handsome man appeared outside of his camp. Currently, 
several of his subordinates crowded around a man, who was wearing a black robe, with their weapons drawn. The black-robed man's face couldn't be seen, but his current posture was quite relaxed as if the hundreds of weapons aimed at him weren't a big deal. Ezio, is it really you? The handsome man asked with a smile. His subordinates made a path for him to pass. Just like the skinny man that had delivered the news, all of them also had shocked expressions on their faces. Their grumpy boss who didn't bat an eye when killing people was actually smiling. It is I, young master, Ezio replied. It's good to see that you are hale and hearty. The commander will be proud. Morgan happily gave Ezio a hug and patted his back. He knew for a fact that his father's shadow guard wouldn't travel far from where his grandfather was. Since Ezio was around, that could only mean one thing. James was also in the central continent. Did father send you to find me? Morgan already knew the answer to this question, but he still decided to ask for clarification. Let me guess. This is about William's achievements in the Tower of Babylon. Ezio nodded. The commander has sent me to find you. He said that you should pack up and go to the Tower of Babylon. He still needed to go to the Misty Sect and someone has to watch over the family's properties while he is away. The corner of Morgan's lips curled up into a smile. Truthfully, when he heard the worldwide announcement, he had been very tempted to go to the tower and find William. However, there were still some loose ends that he had to tie up at that time. He had just finished dealing with an internal struggle a few days ago, so he wasn't in the mood to go to the Tower of Babylon to look for William, whom he hadn't seen since he was a baby. It has been 18 years. Morgan sighed. To think that the baby I brought back to Lant would shock the entire world. I never saw this coming. Neither did I, young master. Little Will is such a handful. Even now, I still can't believe that he has conquered the 51st floor, Ezio commented. Morgan chuckled and patted Ezio's shoulder. You rarely speak more than three words. It seems that my nephew made a deep impression on you, old friend. Ezio didn't deny or agree to Morgan's words. Deep inside, he was feeling proud because he was one of William's masters, who had taught him on how to make his mark on the world of Hestia. Morgan didn't mind Ezio's silence. He knew that the man wasn't an expert when it came to socializing, so he raised his hand to catch the attention of his subordinates. Tonight we feast. Morgan ordered. And tomorrow, we head towards the Tower of Babylon. The men surrounding the two raised their weapons to the air and cheered. They didn't know what they were going to do in the Tower of Babylon, but the members of the Red Plague had quickly learned that asking questions was futile. All they needed to do was follow Morgan, and move unhindered across the central continent. They were the famous mercenary group that was feared by many. Once the Red Plague made its move, the lands would be dyed with the blood of their targets. The next day, the Red Plague marched towards the Tower of Babylon. Countless flags were raised, and the Red Hornet, which was the symbol of their mercenary group, fluttered in the breeze, like a plague that was about to descend to the land and make those who dared to oppose it die a very gruesome and horrible death. This great movement alarmed several empires who were paying close attention to Morgan's movements. It had been a few months since this group carried out an expedition, and the outcome had wiped out an entire clan that was considered to be one of the overlords in the central continent. There was a popular saying among those who knew of the Red Plague. When the Red Plague ascends, calamity descends. This was why even the mighty empires of the central continent turn a blind eye whenever the Red Plague crossed their borders. They knew that as long as they didn't do anything to stop them from completing their mission, their sting wouldn't be pointed in their empire's direction. That Morgan has finally made his move again, the emperor who ruled the empire where the Red Plague was currently stationed had a grim expression on his face. Where are they headed this time? The commander of the army had personally flown using his flying mount to check the direction the Red Plague was headed. After confirming with the head of their logistics department, they had come to the conclusion that Morgan's band of mercenaries were headed towards the Tower of Babylon. The Tower. The emperor frowned. He had just returned from the Creator Empire where the Tournament of Champions was held. 
Half a minute later, the emperor slammed his fist at the armchair of his throne as a shocking realization appeared inside his mind. Ainsworth. The emperor gasped. Morgan's surname is Ainsworth. Everyone in the conference room looked at their king in surprise. They had almost always referred to Morgan as the Red Plague and they had completely forgotten that his surname was Ainsworth. It didn't take long for them to connect the dots and the Emperor immediately issued a decree. Commander, tell all the towns and cities that the Red Plague will pass through to open their doors and not bar them from entering, the Emperor ordered. Also, if they need supplies, like food and water, give it to them with a 50% discount. If they have any additional requests, I give you my permission to carry it out to the best of your abilities. Go and do not fail me. Yes. Your Majesty. The commander saluted and left the conference room. The Emperor had already sent an envoy to the Tower of Babylon in order to negotiate with William for a collaboration. However, the other party was not present, and only an old man was holding down the fort. The leader of the envoy had reported that James was very hard to deal with and the negotiation wasn't producing any results. Now that Morgan was going to the Tower of Babylon, he decided to try and cozy up with the Red Plague in order to smooth out the process of their proposal. The Tower of Babylon had rich resources that couldn't be found anywhere in Hestia. Rare metals that came from higher worlds could be mined on these floors, and were sold for high prices across the continent. If their empire could have a partnership with the Ainsworth family then trying to be on their good side would definitely be worth it. Right now, everyone was like wolves trying to get their share of the fat herd that was waiting to be eaten. The only problem was that instead of a young man, they were up against an old fox who was determined to suck their wallets and blood dry. Because of this, the envoys of the different factions were having a headache. No matter what they did, James wouldn't budge. He was like a dam that was blocking the water source. Even though everyone was thirsty and wanted to drink their fill, he refused to release the water and kept it for himself. This made all the factions feel miserable. More than anything else, they wanted the old man to disappear and be replaced by a fox that was not as old and as stingy as him. If Morgan were to take his place, there was a chance for their empire to enter negotiations. This was what the emperor was hoping for. All of you, draft a new proposal for the floors on the Tower of Babylon, the Emperor ordered his ministers. It's fine if we bleed a little. Once we manage to make Morgan agree, we will be able to regain our losses after a few years. Give him an offer he can't refuse. I'll be preparing for my departure to the Misty Sect. When I return, I only want to hear good news. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Your Majesty. The officials of the Korra Empire started to brainstorm how to create a proposal that Morgan wouldn't be able to refuse. The Emperor looked at this scene with a satisfied look on his face before leaving the rest to his Prime Minister. I shouldn't put all the eggs in a single basket, Shamus, the Emperor of the Korra Empire thought as he walked towards his chambers. The owner of the floors is that boy William. I need to make him understand that working with the Korra Empire is a win-win situation. The Emperor narrowed his gaze as he looked in the direction of the Savadine Mountains. Misty Sect. Shamus sneered let's see if your arrogance will be able to overcome this hurdle that is going to knock on your doorstep. Chapter 690 The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Kenneth was busy writing a letter to his master inside the residence provided to him inside the academy. He wrote how he met William in the Creator Empire, and everything that happened since then. Kenneth respected Arwen with all of his heart. Without her, his life would have been a very boring one. Just as he was about to finish the letter, he heard a knock on his door. Kenneth frowned because he wasn't expecting any guests at the moment. Who could it possibly be? Kennedy muttered as he walked toward the door with curiosity. Kenneth opened the door to see who it was. The first thing he saw was a smiling William carrying a beautiful elf in a princess carry. Naturally, Kenneth recognized the elf in William's arms. It was none other than Pearl, who had also joined the tournament alongside him. Can I come in? William asked. The silver-haired elf frowned, 
but he still opened the door wider and moved aside. A single glance was enough to tell him that Pearl had just fought a battle, because of the tears in her clothes. What happened? Kenneth asked after William laid Pearl to the bed. Since it was a fellow elf, he was alarmed at her current condition. The two of us fought, William replied. Don't worry. I didn't hurt her much. We just had a disagreement. She'll be awake in a day or two. Kenneth walked towards the bed and ran a diagnostic spell on Pearl's body. Aside from the two small puncture wounds on her neck, her body didn't have any kind of damage. Clearly, someone had used a healing spell to remove Pearl's injuries, with the exception of the two marks on her neck. Kenneth had an idea on what William was trying to tell him, because of this, the latter decided to just turn a blind eye on Pearl's current condition. I apologize on behalf for her recklessness, Kenneth said with a calm expression. Thank you for looking after her. William nodded in appreciation. You're still perceptive as always. Kenneth sighed as he sat on the bed. His gaze looked at the red-headed teenager who was looking back at him with a smile. You're leaving? Kenneth asked. Yes. When? William crossed his arms over his chest as he eyed his ex-roommate with an appraising look. Tomorrow. Don't try to find me, because you won't. The silver-haired elf smiled bitterly because he could feel the firmness in William's tone. He knew that if he tried to force himself to accompany him, the half-elf would definitely find a way to lose him along the way. I guess I will be seeing you at the Misty Sect, Kenneth said. William nodded his head. I will be undergoing extensive training until the promised time. Let's meet again in the Aberdeen Mountains. Kenneth's gaze softened because he could feel that William still treated him as a friend. Since that was the case, he would not be too demanding and allow him to do the things he needed. The founding day of the Misty Sect was only several weeks away. It wouldn't be long before he and William would meet once again. Will, don't lose. That's the plan. William left the room and headed to the Alchemist Division to say goodbye to his fifth master, Albert. Although his Alchemist Master was a carefree individual, he still took time to teach William a lot of things when he first arrived at the Academy. While all of this was happening, Princess Sidonie was in her room drafting the plans for the delegation that would go to the Mist Sect. Ash and Chiffon would be leaving with William, leaving her alone in the Empire. This was the plan that they had agreed to beforehand. Princess Sidonie was an important member of the royal family of Frisia and the Creator Empire. Because of this, she couldn't accompany William when he journeyed towards the Misty Sect. However, since she could easily visit the Thousand Beast Domain anytime, this problem was not a big deal for her. She, along with her grandfather, and a few of her cousins would go to the Misty Sect. Everyone had high expectations of William. For them, the battle against his ex fiance was already a done deal. The half-elf was someone that had cleared the 51st floor of the tower. Compared to him, Rebecca was nothing. Unfortunately, they were not aware that he was going to fight his fiancé with increased difficulty due to Aemon's quest. This was also why William was dead set on upgrading all the job classes that he could, in order to prepare for any kind of situation. Meanwhile in the glazed domain of the Misty Sect, Rebecca exhaled, and a cloud of icy air escaped her sensuous lips. I finally broke through the seventh circle, Rebecca muttered as a powerful aura enveloped her body. Due to the unlimited resources, training, special privileges, and her perfect grade talent, she had stepped on the ranks of an archmage four years earlier than usual. The elder that was assigned to watch over her nodded her head in approval. Consolidate your newfound strength, the elder advised. Clear your mind and allow your element to wash over your body. Yes, Elder, Rebecca replied before closing her eyes to meditate. Deep inside, Rebecca was happy. She had finally achieved the height that she had dreamed of when she was young. She and William understood that what they were going to do was merely a formality. Regardless of who won between the two of them, their marriage agreement would be void after their promised battle. On a ship bound to the central continent, Lawrence, the old fox of the Griffith Duchy, 
looked at the ship's window with a depressed expression on his face. They had left the Helan Kingdom a few weeks ago in order to arrive at the Misty Sect, and participate in the festivities that were waiting for them. The old fox played with the communication crystal in his hand, before putting it on top of the table with a sigh. No matter how many times he tried to use the communication crystal to talk to James, the old coot would pretend that he didn't see it. This made Lawrence very annoyed. Rebecca's mother and father had firmly opposed his decision to make his granddaughter William's fiancée, but that was already in the past. Now, the two idiots were feeling fearful that William would come and find them to settle the scores between them. Because of this, Lawrence decided to bring them with him to the Central Continent, in order to mediate and compensate William for the grievances he received in the past. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Lawrence shook his head as he poured himself a glass of wine. I should have been more firm back then. Now, it's too late. Lawrence drank the wine and felt the sourness spreading inside his mouth. The journey towards the central continent would be a long and tiring one he just hoped that when they reached their final destination, the ache he was feeling in his heart would disappear like the passing clouds in the sky.